but over the years we found that um, people were having problems and being diagnosed with schizophrenia and when they were telling me about it I could see the spirits they were talking about but normally we found that most of the people had that kind of predicament were people who just suffered a trauma and that made them hypersensitive and that's when they started picking up on spirit but my big problem has been that the medical profession will just diagnose schizophrenia or, or multiple personality disorder and give people drugs rather than look for the cause they're just treating the symptoms hi everyone that was today's guest mike williamson mike is a practicing medium and author of amongst other books schizophrenia or spirit possession and as part of our continuing series that's the topic i'll be delving into today i'll also be asking mike all the obvious questions that jump into my mind about what his experience has led him to conclude about the objective nature of this other realm now here's mike telling the story of how he became involved in this area in the first place i, I ran my own business and i was just a, an ordinary guy who just sort of got on with his his uh should we say physical life mm -hmm. had no thoughts of any kind regarding spirit or anything like that i just thought it was some cranks who sort of tried to make money off people but then when my daughter got a problem with her foot and uh, she went to a healer and it got better i was a little bit surprised because my wife at the time took over the healing of her foot and the swelling went down <laughs> but what started for me my that started my interest but what really got me going was a lady up the road from us used to run a circle, which my wife went to and invited me along. And I started taking a bit more of an interest, but I felt very uncomfortable there because it didn't feel right to me. So we met up with some other people that had been going there as well and they were uncomfortable. So we started our own development circle, which happened to be in my house. And that's when it disturbed all the uh, energies in the house. And you started noticing things arising. And this, this is a circle where you're investigating contact with spirits in some way. Because that's you, right. yeah. that was when you did the healing. Because I know people think of healing in different ways, this laying of hands healing. But in the way you were approaching it, it was to do with spirits coming through and delivering a healing. Yeah, communication, yes. Mm, okay. So uh, what, what kind of things started arising in, in the house after you started this circle? Well, things started to go missing or it'd be cold spots in different parts of the house or noises. Um, I remember one time I was renovating the house and I put an extra thick cable in my daughter's bedroom light because I wanted it to be ultra safe. And it just blew, blew apart. I know there was nothing wrong with the electrics. And I was told by um, the spirits that we were communicating with at the time that they focus, the negative spirits had focused too much energy on it mm -hmm. and caused it to sort of um, break apart. How true that is, I don't know. But at the time, that seemed feasible to me. Okay, now just, just to back up a second there, when, when you say you were informed by the spirits you were working with. What did that look like? Because I'm assuming you had some sense of, that sense of incredulity and the sense of doubt you initially had continued and then there's a healing. So that opens you up to it. But when does it start, when do you start to believe that you're actually communicating with spirits here? Were, were there particular experiences that shattered your doubts on that? Yes, I was giving my wife healing one day because uh, we were practicing to see what we could uh, sort of find out about it because she had IBS mm -hmm. and it seemed to be helping her with that. But during the healing, she started talking in, uh, should we say another voice? Mm -hmm. And uh, the phraseology she was using was not hers. So this piqued my interest and I decided to investigate further. And by talking to the individual, it turned out that he was one of her guides. This is where I first met Richard, which is a Minoan guy who used the name Richard because he, he wanted to be named after the Richard the Lionheart. Right. 
Um, well, that, that's interesting. I suppose when it's your own wife, it takes away all the questions about is this a scam or not, which you might have if you went to visit a professional medium or something, or is this person deceiving themselves? When it's your wife that's doing it, it cuts through a lot of that, I suppose, quite quickly. It does, but the other thing was that I was able to sit down with an A4 pad every night with masses of questions on them and ask questions. I soon learned that um, logic applied quite a lot to the questions that I asked. And um, I couldn't really deny it because they were telling me things that I didn't know. And when they came about, then it was almost as though they'd sort of predetermined what was going to happen. Okay. And your, your wife is the channel at this moment. Did you yourself start to have experiences of voices coming through you that weren't your own? Yes, I started trancing too and um, got to know my guides. But there are two types of trance, there's light trance and deep trance. Mm -hmm. In deep trance you don't know what's being said and it takes a while to go in and come out of trance. Whereas in light trance you know what's being said all the time and you can come in and out very quickly, which is useful for the job that I do, which is removing negative spirits from people's houses. Okay, because this has been a theme for you right from the start then, that there's a positivity and a negativity to spirit contact or positive and negative spirits. It's just in, in this world, we meet good and bad people and people who are very honest and people who run scams. That's also the case in engaging with the spirit world. And that's been the interesting thing to me, really, the, the variety of experiences, good and bad, that people have there. So how did that develop for you then with with what was going on in your own house and this contact with negative spirits. And what I read in your book was spirits who would often act in a deceptive manner. They pretend to be someone they weren't. Yes, because they try to get control of us and run our lives for us. And one of the things they used to do was to give us pains or memories of pains that we'd had before. Or um, if they came close and they had a pain that they could um, sort of make us feel. And then, it can be quite debilitating too when you get massive headaches for no reason. So we had to learn to protect ourselves from that sort of thing and recognise it when it wasn't our pain. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the negative spirits were concerned, um, it was a learning curve for us all to learn how to deal with that. I didn't realise the reason why I just thought it was a case of clearing my house and getting on with life. But eventually it turned out that other people were asking me how I'd done it and could I help them. So then I started um, running a circle to teach people how to do it. Okay. So now tell me if I've got this right from, from the reading of your books, but initially your work was focused on house clearances and then it, it moved more to looking also at people suffering of things like schizophrenia, hearing voices, multiple personality disorder. And you've made a case that the medical profession would be wise to incorporate that perspective into the treatment of these things, that there, there can be a, a spirit component to it. So can you talk a bit about how your thought evolved there and maybe about the, the kind of transformations you've seen in people who have approached their hearing voices schizophrenia, whatever label we might put on it, from this perspective? Yes, that was interesting because uh, alongside my learning to trance and deal with the spirits, I also developed my clairvoyance, mm -hmm. which was made me, enabled me to sort of um, sense when there were negative spirits around. So if somebody said they had a problem, I would go and check it out. And if there was a problem there, then we deal with it. If there wasn't a problem there, we say so. But over the years, we found that um, people were having problems and being diagnosed with schizophrenia. And when they were telling me about it, I could see the spirits they were talking about. Right, okay. And one of the things that came to mind, like a light bulb moment, if you like, is that the mind and the brain are separate. Mm-hmm. And the medical profession medicate the brain when the problem's coming from the mind. Because spirit, um, when they communicate, they communicate through the mind. 
either good or good or bad if you like and sometimes it's the negative ones that come through but normally we found that most of the people who had that kind of predicament were people who just suffered a trauma mm -hmm. of a hospital visit or an injury or a death in the family or even a birth or a divorce and that made them hypersensitive and that's when they started picking up on spirit but my big problem has been that the medical profession will just diagnose schizophrenia or, or multiple personality disorder and give people drugs rather than look for the cause they're just treating the symptoms and do you find that with this approach people can gain freedom from voices that might be tormenting them well i have helped people over the years um, and cleared the spirits from their houses i also do it um, over the internet as well mm -hmm. currently i'm dealing with some people in america who've been having problems but i have dealt with people all over the world and um, it's called remote clearance mm -hmm. where my guys will go and bring the individual spirits to me so that I can talk to them and sort them out. Because I don't go in with the tests with all guns blazing. I just chat to them, find out what their problem is and resolve it for them. And then they quite happily go on their way or I take them on their way so that they're safe as well. Okay, well, that, that leads me on to asking what their agenda is then. Now, I've had a Dr. Jerry Mazinski on the show who, um, who worked with schizophrenics for his, his career, and he talked about his own realisation, coming to the realisation that there was something other than a brain disorder going on here, that there was actually an actual external entities affecting these people. And he talked about them finding a kind of food supply almost in the people that they were tormenting that, that they they were these entities were getting some sort of benefit from it and often they would target people who felt poorly about themselves for whatever reason childhood trauma or something and uh, because they were a reliable food source they could torment them with thoughts and making them um feel bad about themselves that way and he also reported that by coming to challenge the entities and by um by improving one's self-esteem and thoughts about oneself, there, there could be a freedom gained. What, what's your take on, on, on the agenda of the entities or on their nature and their agenda? Is what, why, what value do they find in attaching themselves to people and, and tormenting them? Well, first of all, we have to separate the fact that there are negative spirits and lost spirits. Okay. The lost spirits don't really know what's going on. They're confused and lost. And, um, they tend to feel an affinity with somebody perhaps and feel safe around them. So they will keep close to them. Then you have the negative spirits who know exactly what they're doing and they do it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to sort of say, look at me, I can control this person. Either case, um, they can be dealt with, but they're, they're not demons or devils. They're just dead people. Right. And as such, they have a certain amount of logic in them. So if you explain to them what they're doing, mostly with the people that are lost, they will happily sort of um, take our advice and we take them over to their loved ones in spirit. And we do this through like trance. So they come through and everybody in the room can hear what they've got to say. This helps them to understand the people in the house what's been happening and the fact that we've actually spoken to the spirits that are causing them problems. And once they see that's cleared, um, sometimes the room seems to brighten, it gets warmer, uh, more peaceful, calmer. And I usually contact the people a couple of weeks after we've been and um, find out, make sure everything's okay and usually everything's settled down. There are the odd occasions when they don't, and that's because the people don't listen to what we're telling them because part of the job is education, mm -hmm. helping them to understand why the spirits do what they do. But when we get the negative spirits, it can be a little bit nasty sometimes. So it can take us a little longer to sort of remove them. 
and the odd, odd spirit that, that really doesn't want to go, then we have to forcibly remove them. But we don't just cast them out. We take them to their guides and their guides look after them until they've settled and seen the error of their way, so to speak. And in your experience, these are all human beings that have passed on the negative spirits. You're, you're saying you're not dealing with anything that you would consider to be demonic and, or anything of that nature. The problem with demons and devils is that that all started with religion, didn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, they used that to scare people into believing in the particular God that they were sort of um, promoting at the time. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> And um, nowadays, there's a collective consciousness, because if I said to you, think of the devil, mm -hmm. you'd have a certain individual in mind, wouldn't you? I would, yes. And so do most people. And spirit can pretend to be that individual, or look right. like that individual, to frighten people. But at the end of the day, all they are are dead people. Okay, that, that's really fascinating. It brings me on to an area that I'm particularly has intrigued me in this is the idea of um, deception or counterfeit spiritual experiences and the idea that these spirits can dress themselves up as um, as something else and people interpret this in different ways so you get a kind of evangelical Christian crowd who think that the benevolent spirits are really demons dressed up as benevolent spirits and then in the likes of what you've just said, you say that negative spirits can dress themselves up as being even more scary again because they know the effect that's going to have. Um, I've also encountered people, and indeed um, Dr. Mazinski confirmed he'd seen this in his work, where spirits that wanted to get an attachment would tell people what they think they wanted to hear. They would tell them that they were a guide or that they would tell them that they were some spiritual being or some kind of ufo from another planet who's come to bring spiritual wisdom whatever they felt might allow them to get a hook in in the same way that you know when people phone you up to um scam you they don't phone you up and demand money they, they phone you up and tell you that you've got a problem with your computer that you need fixing or that you've won the australian lottery or something and they, they try and get the hook into whatever your thing will be okay so some people are susceptible to financial scams some people are susceptible to romance based scams um, and so it, can you speak to that, that the, the role that, cause I think you, you wrote about in your books that you would have uh, entities coming through claiming to be your guides that weren't. What, what role yes. does deception play in this phenomenon? The idea is that, um, if they can deceive you, then you won't get truthful information and the help that you need, uh, when you're working with negative spirits, because, um, we depend quite considerably on our guides because we work as a team and if you've got certain individuals there that are not guides then part of the job won't get done on their side which means it falls apart on our side um, i'm talking about the spirit side and the physical side here of course but one of the problems that um does occur when you get a false guide is you get misled into believing all sorts of strange things that aren't true now i'm not going to say that um people that believe in fairies and that sort of thing are, are wrong um, personally i don't i'm a bit more practical but if it if it helps them then it's a good thing but as far as the negative spirits are concerned their idea of um, attaching themselves to somebody and controlling their lives is because they didn't want to leave their life in the first place. They right. just on this plane. And by controlling somebody, they can live their life through them. So um, sometimes, as I said, it's a, sometimes a little difficult to get people off or spirits off people when they've been there for a long time. It doesn't always happen overnight. And it's not the case of, I've got spirits, can you remove them? And then forget about it. The person that's got the spirit problem needs to do some work of their own. We explain to them what they need to do, which is basically to close down and ignore anything that they feel or think they feel after we've cleared it while their body settles down. And then set their sensitivity sort of calms down a bit so they're not so sensitive to these things. And most of the failings 
are because people can't accept that concept or they don't want to lose this friend that they found in the spirit world. Because if you get a lonely person, a person that lives on their own and is alone a lot, any friend is better than no friend. Yeah, so that, they, that again, that tallies with what Dr. Mazinski said, that he sometimes people will become free of the voices, but then invite them back in because they didn't have anyone else to talk to. Exactly. So I do agree with him there. So what's your process of discernment like? Because I mean, one of the things that I think would concern me about the whole phenomenon is when I've looked at cases where people report that they feel they've been deceived, on the surface at least, it looks very similar to people who feel they're having genuine encounters. Like, um, I mean, one of the books that influenced me this was The Siren Call of Hungry Ghosts by Joe Fisher, the Canadian journalist who reported what initially seemed to be him, like very profound experiences of a trans medium and an ancient Greek guide who spoke a language which clearly was an old Greek dialect and had all this information and everything seemed wonderful. Uh, but then these guides started to encourage people in the, in the circle to have affairs with each other and engage in all sorts of unhealthy practices like that. And it all started to go downhill. Um, but so what's your process of discernment like when, um, well, yeah, just that really discernment when it when it fit, when the information coming from entities that are deceptive can be very compelling sometimes. Well, as I said earlier, working with my guides, I get a lot of help, um, and generally, it's a case of um, if, if, for instance, you do something wrong in your heart, you know you've done something wrong, mm -hmm. um, although you, you consciously override it because there is some gain there for you, perhaps. In this case, um, in your heart, you know whether it's right or not, and uh, you can sense the difference whether there's negativity there or not. It's the energy, really. I suppose you can sense a calm energy or a, or a nasty energy, and that's quite apart from the fact that um, that calm energy might be somebody that's agitated but calm underneath. Mm -hmm. So it's all about learning and developing your senses so that you can check and sort out which is right and which isn't. Okay. It takes a while. I'd like to move on and ask you some more speculative questions, which I fully appreciate you might not have, you know, complete answers to, but I think it's very interesting to ask someone who's had your life experience um, about them. So one of the things that struck me in, in reading the book was the idea of a Minoan guide that lived 4,000 years ago. I, I was thinking, well, just really the, the obvious questions I think that comes into a lot of people's mind who don't have such direct involvement with this experience. I, I almost don't relate to the person I was in my early 20s, okay? And it, it's not that I don't relate to them, but it feels like a long time ago, and it wasn't even 20 years ago. So then when I read about... Um, a Minoan guide who lived 4,000 years ago, the first thing that pops into my mind is, well, in what sense does this spirit still relate to being a person that they were 4,000 years ago? Um, and that, what I'm asking more broadly there is, in what sense do we maintain the identity that we have in this life when we exit it? Do you have any sense of that? Is it like waking up from a dream where the dream doesn't seem that important? Or are we really formed by who we are in this world when, when we carry on? When spirit um, takes a life on the earth plane, mm -hmm. uh, they're there to learn certain lessons or teach certain things to others. At the end of their life, when they go back, they assimilate themselves back into their spirit or their soul, if you will, which to me is the same thing. And that soul holds all the knowledge that that spirit has gained through its existence. And when we ask our friends in spirit to be a guide for us when we come to the earth plane, they will take on a particular guise of a life they previously had so that we can recognize okay. them every time they come through. As far as the fact that it's 4,000 years ago, 
to us it's a long time to them it's yesterday okay because they think in a totally different way to us time has no meaning in spirit uh it's just a case of uh it passes and that's the end of it so it's a little more difficult to explain that but how it was explained to me was um if you take a hill and it erodes slowly through the weather that's time passing mm -hmm. and that's how they see time as passing things change gradually but i did want to pop back to another thing you were talking about earlier yeah and that was schizophrenia and how to tell the difference well schizophrenia does not have any pathology so um if you haven't got the patient in front of you there's no uh lab laboratory checks you can do to find out whether there's something wrong with somebody mm -hmm. but um we have to remember that people with schizophrenia may have an underlying cause that is a brain related problem like a chemical imbalance and so we can't deal with that we can only deal with the spirit side of things i just wanted to clear that up because there are a lot of people that have schizophrenia or have been diagnosed or are just getting interference but there are also a lot of people that have other problems that bring on those symptoms okay yeah so we, we can't reduce it to one thing and say it's definitely that no but what what i do is when i go to somebody's house and they've got that kind of problem i will clear them of the spirits and if they stay clear then we know it was a spirit sure, problem sure. if they don't stay clear and they still have mental problems then it may be there's something else going on as well and i'm not a doctor so i can't diagnose that sort of thing but i will say that going back to the other question about 4,000 year old spirits they um we tend to have guys of a certain age if you like simply because they have the experience mm -hmm. and the expertise to be a guide and um, one of the things that our guides do is protect us from ourselves and help us to uh, follow our life path if you like and if we're working medium then they will work with us to take away the fear of death for other people i.e with clairvoyant messages from loved ones who've passed over right yes, I also do that i go to churches and do demonstrations so in that then do you get a sense of what is important to guides to bring through because what i read in your books and others is they focus on the spiritual on nullifying the fear of death on how to live in life they, they don't seem to focus so much on things like history okay so for example with the minoan guide um, i think there's a lot of mystery surrounding the disappearance of the minoan civilization but your guide doesn't seem passionate to talk about that or um, so what what seems important from their perspective are they, do they take an interest still if someone was a scientist in life might they still have an interest in what's going on in scientific developments here or what the latest historical research on this issue is or do you get the sense that that doesn't seem important to them when they've departed from this world it doesn't seem to be that important to them i mean we did ask questions of richard regarding the minoan civilization and um, he talked to us about um they were in crete and they uh, traded with atlantis before that went down and atlantis was in the mediterranean right but um i'm waiting to for them to find it to prove that point um because at the moment they, they think atlantis is in all sorts of different places don't they i think the latest is that they've picked on the mediterranean right but um that's only in the last few years that's come up and they're investigating so yeah sometimes we can talk to them about their life and times but um most of the time it's all about development and um, understanding right we do i mean one phenomenon i thought about with regard to this is that of um psychic or 
mediumistic detectives, okay, where some people seem to be contacted by um, the victims of a crime, say a murder, and then pass information on to the police. So the, there does seem to be an interest sometimes in, in from spirits newly departed on solving such things. Yes. Um, the best way I can put it is there are so many different types of mediumship and different mediums specialise in different areas and they may have a, an affinity with a certain area so they're better at it. Like psychic detectives who work um, helping the police with murders and things like that. There are also um, mediums who work in doing psychic surgery through trance uh, because that's their speciality if you like or their guide speciality. Mm -hmm. So spirit will use us to the best advantage of those around us so that they can help them in the best way possible. Okay, one comment I wanted to pick up on is just a, a brief paragraph in, in one of your books about the near-death experience phenomenon. So I, I think it's a mystery that has engaged me as to if people have near-death experiences, and they do, why is it only some people that come close or go over the line of physical death, come back and report these experiences and not others? And I don't think I've ever really had a good answer to that. And then just in one paragraph in your book, you, you talk about your guide saying that it's actually because of advances in medicine, spirit guides themselves are unsure as to when a person is going to check out of this world or not sometimes, or when they can be brought back because of new medical techniques they might not have seen before. And that's why some people and not others are having these experiences because essentially it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying the guy that opens it up for them. Um, but then they, they suddenly realize that because of this new surgical technique or this new procedure for restarting the heart, that the body can be restored. So guides are kind of learning as they go on this. Is that an accurate um, representation of, of the information you received? Yes, um, as far as it goes, but what you've got to remember is that some people are stronger constitutionally than others, and so more able to withstand um, the rigors of the death experience and the um, resuscitation. Um, spirit will work with uh, the doctors and the individual spirit of the person um, for the best outcome for them which is not necessarily going to be to bring them back. It may be that they're better off passing over. I think it's an individual thing. For instance, some people will be aware of spirit and some people won't. And in the same way, when somebody's um, under anaesthetic and they sort of cease to sort of think to breathe and then they, they bring them back, um, some people be, will remember and be aware of that and some people won't. But part of the near-death experience is not necessarily passing over, mm -hmm. being aware of the tunnel and um, spirits calling to them or sending them back. They haven't actually died, um, but they're close. Can you shed any light on the, the what's come out in near-death experience research that there's an aspect of it which seems common to all in terms of people having a, a transformative, transcendent experience. But there's an aspect which is subjective in that that experience seems to be masked in a person's cultural conditioning. So Christians or people from a Christian culture may typically meet Jesus in a near-death experience. Hindus tend to have a more Hindu experience of their afterlife. Um, the Japanese, not being a particularly religious people, tend to have a more nondescript experience and of a kind of warm, embracing light. Um, and over time, as we become less religious as a culture, our experiences have shifted from religious imagery more to connecting with family members. Can you shed any light on that? Is, is it all kind of subjective and somewhat what we expect to see? Or is there a kind of objectivity that you think you could point to there well my thought on that is that it's expectations if you expect a certain individual I, I can give you an example of this in actual fact mm -hmm. 
when we were clearing a house one time, we came across a couple of nuns, spirits they were, and we were talking to them and they asked why, we asked them why they hadn't gone to the spirit world. And they said they were waiting for Jesus to come and collect them. Mm -hmm. So I had to explain that Jesus was um, just another man who had a certain message to give to the world and he wasn't going to be there to meet them. And because um, they thought they had to pay penance before they were allowed to go back to heaven, if you like. Mm -hmm. When I explained about that and how the Bible was actually written by man for man to control man, and women were involved only in a subjective way, they began to understand that they'd been duped, if you like. And um, so what we did was we got their mother superior who'd already passed over to come forward and collect them. Mm -hmm. And they were able to go on to heaven, but it was their mindset that stopped them from going. Okay. And that's also the mindset from um, quite a lot of people in different beliefs that stops them from moving away from the earth plane into the spiritual realms because they're expecting certain things to happen. For instance, sometimes they believe that um, once you die, you die, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine they're surprised when they become conscious in another way. So this is one of the problems with the spirits that um, haunt people, if you like. They are troubled and lost and confused because of that sort of uh, situation. And do you perceive that there can be a kind of benevolent deception as well in that people do often report after NDE's powerful experiences with religious characters like contacting Jesus in our culture or the Buddha in China or whatever and um, feeling he was there to guide them over but then he sent them back and I've indeed I've interviewed people who've had powerful experiences with Jesus um, in a near-death setting so how would you interpret that is that divinity masking itself in the way that's appropriate for the person or What's your take on it? It may be. I'm not too sure about that. Um, I can only point you to the um, the living experiences of people that have um, stigmata. Mm. Sure. Um, it can happen in life, and I, I've got to accept the fact that it can happen in, in near-death experience as well. But I think it's a strong belief of the person that causes that particular aspect to come forward rather than um, a spirit pretending to be an individual for that person's benefit. So okay. I think it's more in the mind of the person than um, being projected to them from spirit. Okay, how do, you, um, how do you see your work potentially, and your work in this wider field evolving over the next century or so? Like, do you think that we're at a time where the world of spirit might become much more integrated into this one, where it might indeed become normal to go and see a medium after a bereavement and people might have, it might be considered quite normal to have a kind of contact with one's spirit guides. Is that, do you feel that's the world we, we are on, on the cusp of stepping into at this point? Well, my world is already like that. Yes, quite. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think there's a, um, because of the media coverage and that, there is more acceptance of the spirit world, guides and um, this sort of thing, and loved ones in spirit and life continuing. As far as the spirit world coming closer to the earth plane, I think it'll only be closer in the consciousness um, of the individuals that work within those realms, i.e. from this plane or the next, like mediums and um, that sort of thing. I don't think the general population will all become mediums overnight or even in the next hundred years. But I do believe that people are becoming more accepting of the fact that um, our ancestors are still around us. And it's interesting because when I said our ancestors are still around us, it takes me back to the hunter-gatherers of the um, 
years ago, thousands of years ago, they believed in ancestor worship then, didn't they? So perhaps we're coming in full circle. Sure, sure. Do you perceive that spirit has an agenda in this way, that just as different people have different aspirations for life in this world going beyond themselves for good or for ill? Um, do you perceive that is the case with spirit also, that they might have a plan for how the world might change over a 100 year, 200 year, 1000 year period um, for good or for ill? That we, We're talking about benevolent and benevolent spirits there. Um, do you have any sense of that, of spirits having a greater agenda? Well, I believe that benevolent spirits have the um, upper hand, if you like. Mm-hmm. And so I have more control, but they don't control us. But they try to instigate within us the um, getting back to nature and the damage that mankind has done to the earth mm-hmm. and how um, we need to sort of look after it more if we want to survive it. Um, the malevolent spirits, I don't see that they have much of a handle on um, causing any more problems. And I think it's mankind that's done it. But what I'm thinking from what your question is that you think that um, spirit care about what happens to the earth. Um, oh, well, literally, what, what I'm thinking of my question is that as soon as we acknowledge the existence of this or the realm, then we have to rewrite the history books in a sense because we're obviously missing something out. Okay, if there is another realm of conscious beings that can interact with us in some way, um, and some of them want well for us and some of them don't, then we have to ask the question, well, has this, has this had any effect on history beyond our immediate selves? And, and one example I would cite is um, I was reading recently about John Dee, who's kind of the intellectual architect of the British Empire, drew up the plans for an overseas British Empire and presented them to Queen Elizabeth. And seemingly he got the ideas from scrying sessions um, with a spirit talking to him through a crystal and it, a spirit presenting itself as the Arch- archangel michael telling him wouldn't it be wonderful if um queen elizabeth was the head of a global empire that encompassed all the different religions of the world and i just think that's fascinating if you take this idea seriously the idea that spirits have directly involved themselves in in history that way so that that's the genesis of my question and then just to go on from that um whether it's a benevolent or a malevolent influence and and indeed where that gets great because it, sometimes you know people set up great things in the world and we, we don't know, know if they're, they're good or bad like it, people might have had good intentions in setting up the european union but is it a good thing or a bad thing well that's something we could could debate you know so um, and yeah. that's really where the question is coming from that as soon as we acknowledge the existence the question then can't go unasked okay well i mean the way i see it um, is that any good ideas uh, are usually started off in the mind Hmm. and the mind is in connection with spirit. So I just wonder if perhaps the good ideas come from spirit in a sort of a way of gently guiding us forward rather than um, we have a a brain that sort of thinks these things. Our brain doesn't do the thinking, our mind does. Our mind is the receptor of all our memories and love and emotions and um, our thinking so if it's our mind that's doing it then it's our spirit that's doing it and if it's our spirit that's doing it it's in connection with spirits that are already over in the spirit world so yes I think they're guiding us um, towards a better future but sometimes mankind doesn't always listen does he no sure it's a slow process and i think over the next hundred years we will have a a more um, accepted uh, view of the spirit but the scientific community will have a difficult job proving it and there are those in this world that want the proof before they'll accept these things i mean most mediums are instinctively or have had some experience that has proved to them that spirit exists and they couldn't deny it. Mm -hmm. But um, there were a lot of scientists that um, if you can't redo the experiment twice, it's not real. And they 
they play about with telekinesis and um, remote viewing and that sort of thing without examining the actual basic clairvoyance that goes on in churches up and down the country every night where somebody goes there for a first time and the medium who's never seen them before tells them and describes to them their mother who passed a couple of days ago. And mm. um, if that's not proof of survival, I don't know what is. But the problem is that it's not something you can replicate um, exactly as a scientist would expect, because you're not going to get two people whose parent or mother has just passed who's got the same beliefs anyway. So the experiment in that sense wouldn't work. But in the sense that um, you can describe to a stranger who their parents were or what they look like, that is communication with that particular spirit. And that's the only way that I think they're going to prove it scientifically. Does that make sense? Totally, yeah. I, mean, I think interesting scientific work has been done, right, with um, Dr. Julie Byshell and sort of t trying to take this experience into a laboratory but obviously it loses a lot of its natural environment there too yes it does um but the experiments that they um in my my understanding the experiments that they do are things like um telling them what the next card's going to be or um telling them what next shape is going to be or yeah, um, telepathy experiments, but there, there is research done directly on mediums now, um, where readings were given to um, a, 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 the, the person receiving the reading was given their reading and someone else's written down, and they select they could identify which one was for them at a greater than chance rate. Yeah. So demonstrating that the medium was bringing something through that couldn't be just guesswork. Well, this is one of the problems we do have. Um, there are a lot of psychics around that actually read the person rather than communicate with spirit. Yeah, well, that, that's a different question. Now, where the information is coming from, that's, mm. that's a, much, <laughs> a much, much more difficult thing to demonstrate um, scientifically. Yeah, but I, I do think that um, people are becoming more and more aware because... There was a survey done in America a few years ago and 60% of the people there no longer believe in a person called the devil. Hmm. So um, people are starting to think for themselves and this is why the um, orthodox religions don't have the same following that they did have years ago because people now are thinking for themselves. And what is the only thing that everybody believes without having had proof that there's a God? Mm -hmm. Um, it beggars belief really that people who can reason and think logically can accept there's a God because they've been told there's one without having any proof that there is one. Yeah, another factor that grabbed me about this was just the, the sheer number of people who have had some sort of benevolent after death communication experience. Like you, you're almost, by the time you're at old age, you're, you're almost in a minority if you haven't. I don't think you are in a minority if you haven't had that. And it can be one of the most meaningful parts of someone's life, um, but not something you necessarily share too publicly. So there's, I think there's a perception that it's a much more rare experience than it actually is. Yeah, I do agree with you. I think if you look back on your own life, you've also had some experiences that you couldn't explain, which will be a spiritual experience. I think most people can. If you can think back to your childhood, um, most children have, uh, well, a lot of children, shall we say, have imaginary friends, don't they? Mm. Mm. Usually single children rather than sort of with, without siblings. And this imaginary friend is actually a spirit that they play with. But they only lose that um, idea when they go to school and they meet with other children. Um, who are real and they come more into this world than they were. So I think everybody has a psychic experience once in their life at least. So I do agree with you there. And it's like when people are on their deathbeds and sort of slowly fading, they become more and more aware of their loved ones that have passed anyway because yeah. they come to receive them and take them over. 
So even if they're sort of getting that experience at the last knockings, they're still getting it. Yeah, and that's something that people working in a bereavement setting will report. Because, I mean, it's so, even in the small number of bereavements I've been around, um, I, I've seen that. You know, it's, it's quite clear people are having these experiences around the time of death. Yeah, it's much more common now and talked about than it yeah. used to be. Yeah. People used to think that they were uh, dementia or they're going out of their mind. But now they're, they're, they're becoming more accepting of it, I think. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for that. That's. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview before we wrap up? Um. Not really. I, I don't think. Um, I think it's probably better that people ask questions um, to get the answers they want because it's not always easy to answer a question you don't know you've heard or you haven't heard. If you see what I mean, people are often, people are often afraid of asking questions for made being made to look silly. But my thought has always been that if you've got a question you need an answer so you should ask it and by you asking it it may make somebody else who's a little bit sort of nervous of asking the question it might give them the answer they're looking for too so if you need to know ask okay well i'll link to your website below and the various books you've written um working in the spirit schizophrenia and spirit possession etc and um, yeah, we we'll highly recommend them to people. So thank you very much indeed for coming on today. Thank you, Richard. I've enjoyed it. It's been interesting. Thanks.